Well, good evening on a very cold evening. That does, it represents the last of our lectures for this semester, but I should remind you that there will be, the course continues, and uh, there can be, we try not to re uh, repeat what has been undertaken during a given semester, so we welcome you to think about returning for, for next year uh, as well. Now last week, Professor Sandgren, Eric Sandgren, opened the session by citing the immigrant background of his ancestors. His story is a very familiar one. So prominent has been immigration in the history of this nation. Indeed, the US has often been identified as a nation of, of immigrants to emphasize the heritage that depicts so much of the country. And as you know, so many of you know, Wisconsin has shared in that history and that sharing of the immigrant backgrounds is evident in cultures and <coughs> celebrations in areas throughout the state. But not all residents lay claim to an ancestry in distant locales. Some of the populations in the Southwest, for example, never migrated anywhere, but they were swept in as the boundaries of the US changed. The largest of the non-immigrant population consists, however, of Native Americans whose land the migrants infiltrated. That's one way for describing it. The case of Native Americans and the Wisconsin idea is a complicated one. Chad Goldberg, whose introductory chapter we've recommended <laughs> several times, Goldberg, in discussing the evolution of the Wisconsin idea, notes that its architects of the late 19th and early 20th century, that those architects ignored Native, Amer Native Americans and their history. There are several possible reasons for why there was little systematic attention being paid by the architects of the, of the Wisconsin idea. One is a view that white immigrants and not native peoples were responsible for the advances made. We've referred a couple of times to Frederick Jackson Turner who had spent time here at the university and who was known for his frontier thesis Turner made clear that in his analysis, civilization, the push, the frontier on the frontier, he attributed to what had happened in the case of European immigrants, not the people who had been resident in the state. So there's a possibility that those who had framed the Wisconsin idea never really thought of this population as being important for developments that were important for what, developed, what took place in this state and beyond. It's also possible that there was little attention paid because of the fact that the federal government, rather than the state, shaped policies for and on Native Americans. As many of you know, the treaties that got signed were treaties between the federal government and various Native communities. And those then probably help explain why there wasn't so much attention being paid by the architects of the Wisconsin idea to Native communities. It's also possible that the presence of Native communities located on lands reserved through treaties or through concentrations of populations, just maybe that kind of emphasis on community building did little to attract attention on the part of those who were developing the notions about what Wisconsin should be about. But there have been, at the same time, significant interactions between native communities, native communities in Wisconsin and this university. The lives, the experiences of our presenters tonight exemplify then what I have begun to describe as a complicated picture. Ada Deer, who has been elder in residence, I don't know why that framing 
Z has been just a significant force, is a better way for putting it. But the title has been Elder in Residence Recently. She was, in fact, the first Menominee to earn an undergraduate degree from the university and has had experience on the faculty and in any other, any other number of places and activities. She's widely known for her work that led to the Menominee Restoration Act of 1972, that act that returned the Menominee Reservation to its federally recognized status. And perhaps we'll hear more from her about some of those developments. Larry Nesper, Professor Nesper, directs Native American studies here. And he has a particular interest in nation building among Native peoples in the state. This seems to me extremely relevant because we've been talking about what has happened as Wisconsin, other parts of Wisconsin were working towards native bu nation building, but what about other populations and their attempt to ask, what are we seeking to achieve? These two individuals then are eminently qualified to explore with us not just the past, but also more contemporary developments. And in fact, they put together materials that talk about the Wisconsin idea in the, pre the pre current era. They then can share with us both those historical experiences as well as those from the presence. We then are pleased to have both joining us this evening to help to share with us their observations and experiences about Native Americans and the Wisconsin idea. Professor Nesper. Ada Deer. Thank you, Professor Merritt. It's, uh, it's an honor to be at this class and to be able to be on the same podium in the same with, with Ada. We're, we're good friends, but uh, all you have to do is read her new book, the book that's been the memoir of her life, and you'll know uh, that she's done a lot in this world to change this world. And uh, we would not be in this room in this kind of way had it not been for the work that she's done. Uh, not directly in terms of the Wisconsin idea, but certainly in terms of all the other stuff. But I want to sort of engage this Wisconsin idea and the, and the complexities. The way we're going to work this as an intellectual division of labor is I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Then we're both going to sit down and talk with you about this in question and answer. Ada is mic'd so she can she can uh, chip in or as, as add to this as she would like to and, and may do that. So um, just to, to, to my understanding of this, the short form of this is that the uh, University of Wisconsin should promote the well-being of its citizenry by advancing democracy, providing citizens with assets to enhance their own progress, connecting the citizens with each other. And we have that use of the word citizens repeatedly in that. And I'm not sure where I got that from, but that was one of the statements of that, and I'm sure it's all familiar to, to you when you hear that. So how does this aspiration articulate with the reality that there are 12 native nations, both within the state and alternatively surrounded by the state, right? Because there's a certain sense in which when you're on a reservation, you are not in Wisconsin. You are on federal land, and the law is different in, in that context. So, th so that's maybe some of the ambiguity, wondering about how the Wisconsin idea relates to the tribes, has to do with a sort of uncertainty as to their actual status, uh, or an ambiguity in her status. Um, all of these tribal members are citizens of the state of Wisconsin. Uh, as such, they are within the embrace of the Wisconsin idea, as defined. Um, ironically, in fact, even though, as Professor Merritt was saying, uh, they were not explicitly theorized, the actuality of it is that they were engaged in a kind of Wisconsin idea way quite early, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you what that looks like in just a few minutes. Um, furthermore, in the last, what, 50 years or so, we, it is the policy of the United States to encourage and support 
the self-determination of tribes, right? It used to be that we wanted to assimilate Indian people as individuals, wanted to get rid of tribalism, but now we've changed. In 1975, we've changed in association with Ada's work to see tribes as a good thing in and of themselves and have live in a kind of tri-federal situation where we have the federal government, state governments, and tribal governments articulating with each other. And you might wonder, what are the implications of that for the, uh, uh, the Wisconsin idea? The recognition of the fact of tribal sovereignty, uh, which I have heard even on the lips of the most conservative justices in the Wisconsin Supreme Court, it's quite a moment to hear one of them utter the phrase, tribal sovereignty, these are sovereign nations. I sometimes hear that, and I'm astonished that that's where we're at and that they're the ones who are saying it. If we look at the, the current moment, however, let's start with the current moment and then go back. The university has recently stepped up to recognize the significance of the fact that we are on Ho-Chunk land, was ceded by the Ho-Chunk Nation. Um, so we dedicated this heritage marker that recognizes that fact and the, the text of that marker. How many of you are familiar with this marker? A few, half maybe or so. Okay, so we occupy ancestral Ho Chunk land. They've called it De Jope, uh, 1832 treaty. It was a forced session of land. We use the word ethnic cleansing in this, which is quite astonishing, I think, for the United, for the, for the university to to say we are a part of a state that undertook this. Um, the history of colonization informs our shared future and collaboration today. We, we respect the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation along with the other nations in the state of Wisconsin. It's a big change. It's a difference in terms of how the university sees itself in relationship to the tribes of the state. I think that before this time, there were plenty of relationships between different units of the university and different tribes. It was kind of a rhizomatic structure of a certain kind. Is that there'd be a person here and a person there, and you're going to see this in some of the things I'm going to show you, with their own personal connection with the relationship, no overarching structure. It seems like we've moved in the direction now of really embracing, I think, the Wisconsin idea and including the tribes as total entities within the Wisconsin idea. It's not just the citizens, but it's actually the tribes themselves as political units that I think are being drawn into this. I think it all starts, actually, um, uh, about 100 years ago. Right around the time that the Wisconsin idea is being articulated, the, uh, uh, the leadership of this recently formed Society of American Indians got in contact with Charles Brown, the first state archaeologist, who facilitated contact with President Van Hise and the group of these so-called red progressives came to campus in 1914. This was the first um, uh, progressive profession. These are professional. Most of these people are professionals. Um, they, they were, it was secular. It was a, uh, a group of, of Indian people. They'd been through the boarding schools, and now they were advocating for Indian people, and they came to Madison in 1914, a history that had been long forgotten when we, remember when we, we discovered this in, in about, oh, about 10 years ago or so, we realized this had taken place, there was no institutional memory, and I got it into my head that it was important to bring the tribes back as some kind of celebration and recognition of that. The goals of this group was they wanted full, full citizenship for Indian people, and they wanted access to the court of claims. Um, both national and local native leaders attended that, this thing. This is a, a list of some of the uh, Wisconsin Indian luminaries at these time. All of these people, by virtue of this national organization, had national reputations. And, and you could see their tribal affiliations are all from this region and that. And there's actually a few more I could add to it. But it was, it was an important gathering of national Indian people as well as, or people with national reputations as well as the regional Indian people coming to our campus, being welcomed by our campus uh, and, and such. 
Um, I was just saying earlier, one of, the, one of the Chippewa Indian men who were here, a leader from the Lakota Ray, translated all the speeches that were made by Indian people in Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Menominee. Uh, and, and seeing these as related languages was able to, to say that, uh, to, to carry that out. The group, uh, Denison Wheelock, Oneida, uh, talked about the purpose of this organization. Um, we agree that the Indian's been injured, he's been robbed, he's been cheated out of his property. We all agreed that we're working to remedy these things. So these people are visionaries. He's from uh, the Oneida community there. He was the band leader at Carlisle Indian School. William Kershaw was another figure here, uh, an, a lawyer in Milwaukee from the Corn family, um, and also was a leader in this group. The first uh, American Indian to be ordained in the United States by the Roman Catholic Church was a member of this organization. He was from Bad River Reservation. Uh, there's Wayukasit, the chief of the Menominees at the time, two pictures of him uh, that, who came to this meeting as well. There's Henry Rocloud, the first American Indian to graduate from Yale University played a very strong role in the Miriam Report in 1928, showing all the shortcomings of the Office of Indian Affairs uh, and a leader throughout. John Newey was a, uh, a chief of an off-reservation uh, tribal village, Potawatomis and Ojibwe's and such, came to talk about the treaties and the importance of the treaty relationship between the federal government and that. This meeting would make the news uh, to the point of being reported in the uh, Washington Post because the meeting that took place on this campus, they put together a petition, brought it to President Wilson, and this would in turn uh, be reported in the Washington Post. So what does all have to do with the Wisconsin idea? Well, all right. These are some of the, one of the bullet points about this about what the Wisconsin idea is supposed to be about. I'm highlighting the research directed at solving problems and the idea of conducting outreach. One of the things that happened in this five-day meeting that took place on our campus in 1914 um, was that a sociologist, and I know I just talked to a couple sociologists, and we have sociologist hosts, so a sociologist saved the day, as it were. Uh, Mackenzie. Uh, from Ohio State who had been instrumental in, um, in uh, the development of this organization, came to this meeting. Mostly it was tribal leaders talking. Mostly it was Indian people talking. But Mackenzie at one point gets up and he says to all of us here at the University of Wisconsin, he says, this university has led gloriously this way of education in this country. But on this point, they have not come up to their duty. There are at least 6,000 American Indians in the state of Wisconsin, and what are we doing? Our field workers are sent by our universities to China, to Africa, and other parts of the earth, but how many of you sent from this university to the Indians of Wisconsin and the United States? So we get called out at this point in the context of this meeting, in front of these Indian leaders, in front of other university officials are called out by this Ohio State sociologist, and it begins to have immediate consequences. Um, it looks like the Menominees initiated a relationship with the, United, uh, with the, with the university at this moment, and um, uh, they asked the university for a judge and a speaker for their annual fair, asking Agricultural Extension Service of CALS uh, at the time of the meet at the 1914 meeting, right at the time of this meeting. So the channel was opened up at that moment, and the Menominees asked for this person to come up to their annual fair. This took place in the spring of 1915. Dean Russell of CALS then sent Waita out as the agricultural agent, and he began to do a number of what are called Indian Farm Institutes in association with this. He was um, a state leader of the county agents, and he worked for the tribes for 27 years. Uh, in a 2010 article written about him, 
the quote is, no other state had such a dedicated and consistent advocate for extending agricultural extension service programs to Indian farmers. So it might be true that the people who were theorizing the Wisconsin idea were not thinking about the tribes, but Russell, the dean of Cal's was, and this um, uh, uh, man Waita was as well, and did quite a bit of work. Four annual farming institutes would take place every year beginning at that time in 1915. Um, you get a sense of that, and it, the, it was a day-long program, and it was all ex really an exchange. This is a, a quote I noted from, the, uh, from Goldberg's piece, talking about the Wisconsin idea as being an exchange, a flow between experts and ordinary people. Well, in this case, the ordinary people were the tribal members who were trying to do agriculture out there, and, the, and then we had the CALS experts coming out making suggestions. And from what I can tell from this, there really was an exchange of the, of the tribes talking about the problems they were having and extension getting the message. So the Wisconsin idea and this kind of initiative is starting up at this point. I also was recently, I, I, no one else has read the Odana Star, which was a, um, I've read quite a bit of the Odana Star, a tribal newspaper between 1912 and 1916. Uh, actually had coverage of the, some of this as well. The um, July 14, 1916 issue is about a plan for a farm institute, and someone was in Madison, this guy, Morrison, one of the tribal members, was in Madison Saturday to confer with the heads of the University Department of Agriculture. The university people are said to be considerably interested. And what I think is interesting about this is that we may think that the Wisconsin idea is the sharing of the knowledge out into the state and, and, and developing democracy, but in both of these cases, it looks like we have Indian people recognizing the university for the kind of thing that it is and reaching out to it and making that, making that linkage, that establishing that relationship, starting that out. Um, these agricultural institutes, the Indian Farm Institutes, have been criticized in the literature for being assimilationist, okay? That we're trying to turn the Indian people into farmers who work on, you know, who work for the purposes of producing surpluses and market articulation. That's true. That was our intention as a university. That's what we knew. That's what we shared. Indian people recognized that that's what we knew and that's what we could share and took from it what they wanted as the result of it, right? It was an assimilationist agenda to the extent to which you can put the, array this in terms of the kinds of relationships that um, an institution might have with a, with a sovereign tribal entity. However, I think Indian people were strong enough to, to be able to figure out what was, what was the wheat and what was the chaff as the result of this. Um, the Ho-Chunk opted, for example, for seasonal wage work and peace work, but they nonetheless hosted some of these events or acquiesced in having some of these events. Bad River had better agricultural land up way up in the north, and they were more permanently located there, so they were more interested in these things. So there's variable interest amongst the tribes on this. All of the tribal groups kept up their traditional subsistence practices to the degree to which they could, and they complemented with agricultural practices that the university was availing. So our relationship with the, I, I, think, I can't find anything before 1915 where there looks like there's an extension, or there couldn't have been an extension. Extension is like 1909 is when it starts. So this is early in the history of extension. Uh, before that, I've not been able to find any interest of any real substance between the university and, and what it's doing and the tribes of the state. So this is really a kind of watershed moment. Um, so we have CALS and the Indian Farm Institutes, and I'm going to talk about this second one in a minute, and I think we'll move on then from that. Uh, but we have a number of, of, of things beginning to happen uh, as a result of that. And, um, and these are obviously, these are highlights, and these are things that we've been able to discover. And it's like, some of you know this, from studying a rhizomic structure with all of the connections that are under the surface and multi-dimensional connections between multiple bodies, they're hard to find. 
It's hard to go anywhere in this university and say, what is our relationship with the tribes? Where do you go to find that out? I mean, there's no, I, I wrote, emailed all of the chairs in the university, and some of them take it seriously, and some of it don't. Some of them know, and some of them don't. If you have a, a department with 45, 50 people in it, you may or may not know who's doing what kind of research with what kind of tribe. So it's a, it's a very difficult thing to try to understand. It's an enormous unit, or enormous uh, structure. Um, so we have that, we have a number of projects, and we have then a number of what I'm calling tribal institutional interfaces, American Indian Studies, La Follette School, the Folklore Program, Great Lakes Indian Law Center, Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission is here, uh, Institute of, of Environmental Studies. All of these entities are either explicitly, in most cases explicitly, but in some cases uh, um, inexplicitly or, or, or implicitly engage with the tribes in some capacity or another. I want to talk about another uh, project, and that's this um, a WPA linguistic and ethnological studies project that took place in the 40s. And again, um, again, not perhaps, I don't even know if Morris Swedish or Sw Swedish or Floyd Lounsbury knew about the Wisconsin idea. Nonetheless, they would, in, they would initiate this research with the, uh, with the Oneida tribe in 1939. Swadesh re reached out to the Oneida to do a project on language, and he was welcomed by that. The Oneidas were concerned about their language not being spoken so much anymore, concerned about losing it. He gets a WPA grant, Works Progress Administration, is that what that is? Works Progress Administration grant to pay two women and nine men for 18 months who are writing down stories in the Oneida language. He would not be renewed at the university here, um, so he picked up, he had a very aggressive young uh, undergraduate student, Floyd Lounsbury, who continued the project and wound up getting his master's and his PhD and generating a tremendous amount of Oneida linguistic material. And uh, it is said of this project that this founded the contemporary interest in Iroquoian linguistics. So this was a major moment in the relationship, at least between the Department of Anthropology and the, uh, and the Oneida tribe. There was a second project that was done that was funded, um, uh, uh, it was basically on history, on uh, people writing about their beliefs, people writing about uh, recipes, a kind of ethnographic project, ethnological project. Um, this would fill 167 notebooks 18,000 pages of text and that, and wind up in a box in the basement of the Social Science Building where it sat for decades. It was found in about uh, 2002 by, Oneida, by uh, Herb, Herb Lewis in the Department of Anthropology who worked in collaboration now with the Oneidas, um, some of whom were descendants of the original authors, uh, uh, original authors in the production of the book Oneida Lives which I also see as a kind of Wisconsin idea kind of thing, is that this is, a, this is a collaboration, this is about the development of the tribal property in the form of language, uh, development of that relationship. So in both cases, and I think these are both seminal cases, these are good relations between the tribes and the, and, and, and the university. And I think the tribe is living, or the, the university is trying to live up to its reputation as embracing all of the citizens of the state uh, defined in a very broad way. The uh, original materials for that and the copies uh, of those things are now in the Wisconsin Historical Society as well as UW Green Bay and uh, the Oneida Cultural Heritage Department. So those things, the copies have been made and they've been placed in various archives for available for use. Um, there's Ada, in when she was an undergraduate here in, in, in 1954 to 1957. And I put that in here because there's no project. I mean, here, here we are, Ada comes to the university. She and I were talking about this beforehand. And I said, well, what about the Wisconsin idea when you were an undergraduate? And, and you said, well, 
I mean, do undergraduates know about things like this, right? Did you want to make a comment on that, about, about your time at the university and how it related to uh, tribes? Yeah. Is that on? There is a microscopic little thing here. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, okay. good. Well, first of all, I want to commend to everybody who's here. It's the end of the semester, and uh, I was an undergraduate here, and that's a very, very uh, difficult time, and pre pressure, and grades, and, and all this stuff. So uh, <clears throat> it's wonderful that you're, you're here in this uh, difficult time, and I appreciate the professor uh, and the, the two professors here with their overviews and with their uh, wonderful knowledge. Uh, I, I really uh, enjoy uh, hearing uh, from such learned people. And so now <clears throat> I graduated from Shawna High School in 1953. I was here from 1953 to 1957. And I, I asked my uh, Latin teacher, who happened also to, to be the guidance teacher, uh, where is the best university that I can afford? And he immediately said the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So I said, oh, well, how do I, how do I get, uh, apply? And so he gave me the address, and I sent in my information, and I applied, and I was very happy about that. Um, but all of the materials never arrived. And after I arrived on the campus, about three weeks later, this big package of information from the university arrives at Barnard Hall, where I was uh, uh, living. And uh, I really needed that all that information ahead of time, but I didn't get it. So that was uh, unfortunate. But on the other hand, I'm a very curious person. And so I got uh, uh, enrolled. But to answer uh, your question, uh, uh, Professor Larry, yeah. um, I had never heard of the Wisconsin idea. But I like the idea that I was at the big university. And at but that point, it, it was really big to me. It was 20,000 students. And now there's like 44,000 I read in the paper the other day. And so it has really uh, expanded. But it was a, it's a wonderful, wonderful university. And I tell people all the time that uh, um, they, uh, in a way, reached out with these papers later. But uh, I had a wonderful education here, uh, question authority, um, and I, uh, living in the dorm, uh, we had the opportunity to invite professors uh, at uh, various times. And so I decided to do that. And uh, I didn't realize that all, most of these professors were world famous professors because they didn't uh, advertise their, their backgrounds. Of course, now we have Google and all that, and so you can find out everything about everybody. But at any rate, um, all the students liked to sit at my table because Ada Deer invited a lot of professors. And so, uh, well, they could do that too. I mean, they were all from white middle-class homes, and I was from this log cabin on a reservation with no water, no electricity, uh, an outhouse, etc. cetera. But, um, I got here and it just opened up my mind and I, I just loved every day of it. It was, it was hard. Once I got out of my first preference of uh, studying for um, algebra, and I, I'm not a scientist. I wanted to be a doctor, but when I found out I had to take algebra and chemistry again, I said, oh, I'll never get the grades to get into medical school. So I changed to liberal arts and then um, it was a wonderful journey uh, then. Now, I don't know when I heard about the Wisconsin idea, but um, I liked it. It sounded so welcoming and so important and so wonderful that this university had conceptualized and had uh, publicized this around the state. But I don't think that any people ever came to the reservation uh, while I was there and I think there were, I know that after our tribe got terminated, 
Uh, that's a whole long story, but the, the government doesn't know what to do with Indians yet. And uh, that's, uh, they've tried all kinds of policies. Uh, first there was uh, genocides, and then there was the, um, the diseases that came, and, and various other policies. And the policy in the 50s was termination, which meant that the federal government would withdraw their from their responsibilities and, and then, then just the tribe would be on its own. Now my tribe is the only tribe that has its basic origins here in Wisconsin. We never came from anywhere else. We were here originally. And uh, it's wonderful that the university is paying attention to this uh, Ho-Chunk land with the Dijop uh, residence hall and uh, markings of the um, other uh, activities there. I was assistant secretary uh, from 1993 uh, to 1977, and I had the honor of signing the new constitution of the Ho-Chunks. Mm. So that was exciting. And that, ho so, that constitution was written with association with our law school. Mm -hmm. Now, at the law school, we have um, Professor Richard Manette, who is from Turtle Mountain, and he's been here for, I think, about 30 years. And he has really reached out to the people, and I think he's the most active one that I know of. Mm. That the tribal people know he's here. They're very proud of the fact that uh, a native person is uh, there at the law school. He's consulted. He's helped write constitutions. Uh, he's he's a, a wonderful person, and I would suggest if you do something like this again, you should have him. Because he's an expert in Indian law, and and he's very popular with the students. So well, this points to another interaction. Uh, we are now having a number of faculty members of varying um, degrees of Indianness. I guess that's the best way of saying it. Of, um, I, I haven't met the most recent ones yet. There are two or three that I haven't met. But at, at any rate, uh, coming here, I had never heard of the Wisconsin idea. I had no idea what, what it meant. But over the years, uh, I've come to appreciate that. And I think that it's time now to really uh, focus in on that. And I think the fact that there are more Indian students now certainly does have uh, un university impact. Mm -hmm. But um, we don't have enough researchers or, pe or people like that who can then reach out. Uh, there are many, many needs on the reservations, and it would be wonderful for the universities in a more systematic way to uh, establish uh, relationships again and become available. Yes, I, I know that uh, people go to the exotic places. You know, oh, I was thinking about the, your, uh, your department. Uh, one of the professors goes off to Pakistan and, 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 and other places. Uh, and then we do, we do have Professor Lewis and we have a, another uh, a woman um, who's, who's Oh, Sybil, Sybil? Sissel. Oh, yeah, Sissel Schrader. Schrader. Yeah. Schrader. Uh, at any rate, uh, I don't want to ramble on, but it still needs much more attention by the university. And uh, we do have a, in the American Indian Studies program that started in 1972. However, uh, and it goes up and it goes down because it's a program. Many of the professors come and then they, they teach courses for a while and uh, then they move on because it's a program, it's not a department. So one of the things that I would like to see is a Department of American Indian Studies mm -hmm. where scholars could come and as other uh, departments have, have the practice of doing. Mm -hmm. And um, it does deserve, our people do deserve a Department of Indian <laughs> Studies. Mm -hmm. There are the tribes here with different economies, with different tribal cultures. And uh, we do have uh, Dr. Monica McCauley, who has been working with my tribe, the Menominee tribe, on the Menominee language. She helped develop a dictionary, and this has been going on for at least 15 years or yeah. so. And she's made a tremendous impact. And so uh, when we have professors that are able to spend time on significant tasks or projects for the tribes, it really does enhance uh, the, the natives' uh, knowledge, uh, tribal knowledge, and um, then 
it, the circle is complete now, I think, with, with yeah. Monica doing that, and you have also done work with uh, tribal judges, and he likes to run with the Indians. I picked up the paper once, I think it was from Lac du Flambeau, and I said, there's all these Indians running, there's in the middle of it is this white man. I said, who is this? Later, I found out it was Larry Nisper running with the Indians. <laughs> so, I, yeah, he takes his task seriously. <laughs> well, I could go on and on, but maybe we should move to questions and answers now. This class Let me just say a few more things. How oh. much time we got? We have a few more? Oh, say yeah. a few more items onto this, and I'll just okay. say this. I just want to say, you don't have to crane your neck to see this, yeah. but, but while you were on campus, uh, there was a CW Loomer. I don't know which department he was in, but it was already working on this kind of terminationist economy, and he did a paper called The Possibilities for Commercial Recreation Industry on the Menominee Indian Reservation. So this was already, I think, in that terminationist era. It hadn't begun yet, but it was that uh, maybe the dark side of the Wisconsin idea in the sense of facilitating this. And Ada just said that these are some of the, the, the centers that exist on campus, and she mentioned that she signed the Constitution, and there's a copy of that Constitution right now in the Memorial Library in a display case where they're showing this, uh, the heritage marker plaque is there, and they have a display case of that, and they got a copy of the Constitution with your signature on the Ho-Chunk Constitution that was written with consultation with the UW Law School, right? So that, I, I see that as a kind of mutual um, interest kind of project that went on. I said that there is a uh, Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, the Ojibwe tribes have a, an, an MOU that they signed with the university. There's examples like a housing project at La Couture was done by one of the departments. Barbara Bournes did a, also did work with the, uh, with the La Couture band on, on the Chippewa flowage. The Northern Highland District uh, exploration of of, of uh, uh, the limnology uh, center. Mm -hmm. Again, there's Monica. Monica's work on the Menominee Dictionary is there. The library's got a project going. Uh, we've got a project, we had a project going with New, uh, Wisconsin Nutrition and Growth Study. And that, so there's a lot that, this was all before the big tribal summit that we did in, uh, in uh, 2015. Ho-Chunk people came here for the dedication of the Dejope Residence Hall, endorsing that project. And then we had this big summit on approximately the 100th anniversary of that. And this was brought the tribal <coughs> leaders to campus, uh, brought, had the tribal leaders bring their administrators to campus in the area of health and environmental issues, and had researchers sit down with tribal officials. They were talking about their issues, that their problems that were amenable to research and getting responses from the researchers here on campus and figuring out a way to do collaborative work. Since then, um, there have been quite a number of things. This is some images from that, uh, from that tribal summit that took place. There's the tribal leadership on the left and a moment in the tribal. And you can see that image again of the 1914 meeting that was evoking the, this, this hundred year relationship between the university and the tribes. Um, most recently, I contacted Doug Reineman, who is Associate Dean for Extension in CALS, and I asked him what's going on out there with Extension and with CALS, since you guys, in a sense, started all, What's it look like in 2018, 2019? And he provided me a 12-page, uh, single-spaced document that was identified all of the different things that are going on. I'm not going to stand here and recite those to you. But we can avail those to you if you're ever interested. I'm going to tell you, I, Doug, what I did is I put them into categories because they weren't in categories when we, when we got, but now they're in categories. And I'll just tell you, these are the categories within which there are projects, activities, initiatives on the part of the university um, that relate to the tribes. We have, there's, there are a number of projects in the area of education, an eight-day field course, for example, an all-day youth event with, with uh, tribal youth, a five-day course in partnership with Carroll University. 
There's a whole category of activities that are going on in the register of tribal food sovereignty, which has become a very big issue, right? Lots of ways for the university to engage with that. Everything from what biologists to sociologists to anthropologists to food nutrition people, et cetera. There's what, five or six projects that. There are five or six projects in the area of energy development and climate change. Uh, that are that have been engaged and have been undertaken. There are a few projects in the area of economy and resource development. Um, then there are a whole bunch of projects in the area of institutional articulation, the attempt to create permanent structures between the university and the, the tribes. So there's a lot that's going on. Now, one of the things that came out of this summit was a group called the Native Nations uh, UW Working Group. One of their recommendations was to create a director of tribal relations to join the director of state relations, the director of corporate relations, and the director of federal relations, so that now we have a centralized point of contact between the tribes where the tribes will be able to speak at a high level into the chancellor's and the provost's office about the issues they are facing and then a, a more coherent mechanism for transmitting the messages between the tribes and the university instead of this kind of rhizomatic structure that is, exists at all these different levels. All of that I expect is going to continue, but I think that with this more centralized figure, there'll be, there'll be an opportunity to fund things better, to give things more uh, uh, airplay within the university community. So that's what I wanted to say about all this. The most recent thing I have here is, well, there was a leadership summit. After, after what, four years, we had the leadership come back and had another summit where we talked about the same kind of issues. And there's been now uh, Native Nations Nursing Summit as well. So there's a lot of different things going on, and I think I'm going to sit and maybe we can have some question and answer for a little while and talk about this, uh, this relationship, how it's been conceived, its history, or anything that you might be interested in. And they're quite serious about entertaining questions and comments. There are, I think, any number, and one of them I wanted to raise with Ada. You've been the elder in residence, and it's now a program at the university, right. and someone is, is succeeding you in that role. What do you see as its responsibilities, and especially in light of the conversation just had, or the comments just made, about trying to have something that is a little more structured in terms of the university and the, the nations? Well, as time goes on and contacts evolve and so on, I think we're moving toward it. Uh, the tribes are uh, sending out some of their students, and I'm very proud to say I just read one of the university publications, an article from the School of Journalism that a member from my tribe uh, is now in the law school as a student. Uh, I believe that my sister Connie was the first, uh, at least the first Menominee, I don't know if, if others um, came or not, but she graduated from the, she got her BA and, uh, and became a nurse, and then after a while she decided to go to law school. So she's got two degrees from uh, the university, and that's had a big impact on, on our family. And uh, I should say, the old, I was the oldest of five. For I decided I wasn't going to be poor, and I didn't want my brothers and sisters to be poor. So uh, four out of five of us have our degrees from here. Um, and my brother had two, uh, three degrees, his bachelor's and two master's degrees. And I have my bachelor's degrees. So at, at any rate, uh, the students that come, they then spread the word. And uh, there is a student group here called uh, the um, what is it? Wong Chi. Oh yeah, the Wong Chi. And they put on powwows and so on. So I think as, as a whole, there's forward movement. But uh, as I mentioned, I think it could really be accentuated if we had a Department of Indian Studies. And uh, then we would have professors who would teach them. Hopefully there would be some that would be Native people, but we don't know it yet. But the point is to have a department 
that would then be the center for the scholarship and, uh, and the various uh, research. Uh, actually, there, I do know one young woman, uh, she now became a lawyer, but at the time she was studying anthropology. I said, wow, you could get an anthropology depar department and go and study the white people. Because <laughs> everybody wants to study us. <laughs> A footnote to Ada's comment about the elder in residence just on this is it's true we have another elder in residence coming in the spring uh, so that this will be the third person and that also came out of this Native Nations initiative which in turn came out of the summit as this thing. So we're building out of this event, building structures and also building programs as, as part of that. Hey Ada. Hi. It's Pam. Yes, um, I know. So, Distinguished professor of <laughs> So, but I was also. actually, um, I'll just, you know, jog your memory. Ada and I used to work together in a group that was focused on criminal justice issues. And so at one point, Ada asked me to run a bunch of statistics on American Indians in prison in Wisconsin so that we could do that because she was going to go hassle the Great Lakes tribal group about uh, getting more services in the prisons for Native people. So. Um, what I wanted to ask you, and also Larry, but especially you, Ada, is, is so um, there's lots of good stuff starting to happen, but are, do you have your eyes on things that should be happening that aren't happening yet that should be called to people's attention as things that maybe should be percolating around, needs that the, the tribes or the people are aware of that folks should be attending to? Well, it's... it's Let's see, how am I supposed to talk into this? You don't have to talk into it at all. You've got the little thing on your... Oh, 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 I see. Okay. Um, well, I th I'm really impressed with uh, Larry's presentation on, um, and the 12 pages from extension alone. Really? So my first point would be to have a systematic communication of this to all the tribes. They have, many of the tribes have tribal newsletters, and uh, they, should, sh they should know. But I think it's, it's good to have an open arms um, approach. And uh, you were very helpful to me in that uh, statistical analysis that you provided. And uh, it helps get, you know. Yeah, I'm trying to point to it as an example. You asked me to do something, so I did it. That's um, right, that's yeah. right. I mean, which is what I think is one thing the university could be doing is to do stuff right. that people ask us to do. But, right. um, but, but how do we, that's why I was sort of trying I, I, to open the question. If I could, I'll pick up on that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I think that there could be more uh, personal attention. When you go up to the reservations, uh, they get the data and so on. Uh, I, I, I don't know all, all of them that, that do that. But I was impressed once um, I went to uh, Creighton University, and they send their faculty to go to the reservations in South Dakota as, and this is as recruiters. And then this reminded me of how I came to the university. Uh, you know, I'm, wherever I'm at, people find me. Okay, so uh, this was as a result of my work with uh, my tribe, the restoration tribe of the tribe. Uh, our tribe was terminated from federal supervision. We suffered a lot. The, the land became subject to taxation. Our hospital was closed. A, a cultural, economic, political disaster. And, and then started selling our land, and, and they wanted to do, develop it, and so on. Well, anyway, a number of us got together, and long story short, we achieved uh, restoration, restoration of our rec and recognition of our um, tribe. At any rate, uh, so we were the first tribe terminated, that was in the 50s, that was the way that was going to solve the Indian problem. Notice, was, notice there's only one Indian and one problem. <laughs> and um, people always ask me that, and then I tell them that too. At any rate, um, the, rest, the restoration then did get some publicity, and who comes up there? The chancellor of the university, Ed Young at the time. And oh, I thought he was just passing through because you know maybe he was taking a trip somewhere or something. No, he said he, he brought his wife, he brought Truman Lowe, Ho Chunk artist who recently passed on, and his driver. And he said, well, I came to invite you to become a member of the faculty. And I said, 
whoa, I said, wow, I said, uh, uh, oh, I don't know if you really know, but you know, my background, well, of course I knew he did, but uh, not that, but I, I, I was just reacting to the moment, because I thought everybody at the university had to have a PhD, and, and I told him I didn't have a PhD, I had a master's degree, which was the terminal degree at the time I took it, which was in 1961, because I wanted to do, you know, social work is a doing profession. At any rate, well, other professions are too, but the idea of being a doer really attracted me. And so um, he said, well, we have all kinds of people at the university, and um, all you have to do is come down and uh, teach a course, and then you can do whatever, whatever else you want. <laughs> I said, wow. I said, well, I, let me think about this for a little bit. Well, I thought about it, and there was this, an offer that uh, I couldn't turn down. Mm. And so, I mean, talk about high-ranking person. And since then, well, then he um, invited me to his home and to the chancellor's receptions, and I, I didn't realize it at the time. I thought, well, I thought he probably did this with a number of people. Well, he probably did, but you know, I, I see that Professor Crow here. I was sitting next to Professor Crow at one of his party, uh, one of his dinner parties. You know, the chancellor. So, so I felt that it was really uh, important to um, take advantage of that opportunity. And he was very charming, and I became very close with the, the whole family. Went to the wedding of one of the his children and so on. But I'm, I'm just using that as my personal example. But there has to be more personal interaction. Mm. Um, and so that's hard because you're here in Madison and that the, my reservation is three hours north. But I think if there could be a consistent contact between uh, the university people. I remember a professor, uh, Dr. Adams, the, the medical doctor. Oh, Alex, yeah. Yeah, Alex Adams. Well, and, and she sought me out, too, because I was over there at the School of Social Work and also at American Indian Studies. And uh, she was doing a study on di diabetes with our tribe. Diabetes is a very serious disease among Native people. And uh, she was do studying the, um, this. And actually, she came, I think she provided some possible solutions. At any rate, but what did she do? She met when when people were available. Uh, she met she met with them. So she was up on our our reservation on a Sunday, so that uh, people didn't have to work and they had free time. So of course, time is very precious to all of us. But she came up to, on Sunday and uh, talked with parents and the schools and so on. And I thought that was very touching on her part. It took away from her own family. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm not saying that everybody has to do that, but if a number of people would consistently um, maintain contact with the people, that, that means a, a lot. Uh, and people always want to study Indians, you know, so. So, so the, the current initiative, if you call it that, the, our, our shared future is, has been established in part to raise just general awareness about the connection of uh, Native Americans with this land and, and how it predated the connection we have and, and to find shared meaning in that. Um, and I'm wondering if that might in some ways serve a similar function to, to this, you know, connecting all these rhizomes and it, giving the people on the university an idea really about what the history is. And, and how do you view that initiative, and, and what do you think is going to be necessary in order for it to work? Great question. Yeah, it's a big question. <clears throat> well, let me say the, the, the Indian people are mentioned twice in the Constitution, and, and once in the Commerce Clause, once in the Treaty Clause. And this, um, to me, was really important to, to know. And if the educational system needs courses on American Indian history and culture and tribal government, yes, there's Act 31. And, all, and, and the, this is supposed to be taught in the public schools here, but there's not much money that is allocated to that. And some schools do it on, the, on their own, but it's, it's voluntary. 
So many people are deficient in their knowledge of American Indian tribes and history and so on. But while I'm at it, the same applies to women, the same applies to blacks, the same applies to Asians. Uh, one time I, I got a chance to go to Ch China and I thought to myself, what, are, what do I know about Chinese? Chinese food, you know, Chinese laundry, and you know, then I was stretching it. So I decided I didn't know anything and I like to read, so I speed read five books on the plane going over there and I was really glad I did because uh, one of the sections had to do with the, rev rev the revolution and the grand big march in uh, China under, uh, I think it was Chairman Mao. At any rate, uh, I, I, was sit I ended up in one, at one time sitting in the back of the bus with, uh, and we all had translators, uh, and it was so exciting talking to this gentleman because I had read these five books and so I, oh, I know Chinese laundry, I forgot about that. But anyway, so, so I, I actually read these books before I went, so I, I didn't want to be an ugly American just staring down um, the, well, just being, yeah, being an ugly American. At any rate, well, so then I talked to him about the Grand March and he, he turned out to have been on that Grand March. Uh, and and um, I said, well, that was wonderful that uh, Chairman Mao uh, ordered that there would be no stealing from the people, no violence against the people, and he was really impressed that I knew something about his country. So, so you, there, are, there are courses, there are lots of books, there is the, uh, there is, uh, let's see, the history, people's history of the U.S., it starts with the first chapter on India, that's the first book I ever picked up, that the first chapter was usually there at the end of the book, right, mm -hmm. or a footnote somewhere. So I would, I would encourage people to really get informed. But then there are other books like, um, oh, let's see, Indian Givers and Native Names, and there, there are a lot of books that you could read and it would change your attitude and your, and your information because most of us, and I have, my father was Indian, my mother was white, and claim both heritages, and I claim everybody else, whether they want me to or not. So, at, at any rate, you know, you're a human on the planet, you know, that's all, that, that's that. But I've been reading a lot about the differences and, and why. Well, there's, there's this conscious as well as unconscious attitude of superiority of white people toward people of different colors. It's built into our culture, and it takes a lot of understanding, and I'm not saying everybody, but that's, that's the way it is. And so when people have told, told me once in a while, you don't look Indian. I said, well, how is an Indian supposed to look? Well, you don't act like an Indian. How is an Indian supposed to act? Well, you know, they have these stereotypes, and this goes for all the groups, the Chinese and blacks and, and the browns, other browns. So um, you're asking a really interesting question. Uh, if you really wanted to do this, then you need to read, uh, well, right now slavery is being uh, featured in some of the movies and so on. And I, I have a, a number of black friends and I've been down south. And I, I went on a vacation once when they still had segregated uh, water fountains and I actually saw these and I, it just shocked me. That was, we went to Virginia. And so anyway, um, I think it's a lifelong process of learning we're all humans on the planet, and we are all we all have the same basic needs. And if there there could be a, a change that people of color have cultures and may have made great contributions wherever they were at, uh, instead of oh there you know there's this automatic thing oh you're different you know and. Uh, but that, that's a, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of things to answer. And, and you might have something that you'd like to answer to that. I'll follow that up oh, just in okay. terms of that. I think there's some institutional moves. This, I have a lot of hope for this director of tribal relations. Uh, the, the, I know that the provost, for example, is interested in these matters. And he's been talking to faculty member about just kind of saying, well, should we do this or might we do that? And, and I, 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 there's a level of commitment, or it's a commitment at the level in the university there has never been before. I, when, I first, when it first occurred to me that the tribal leadership needed to be invited to campus, I had, I can't tell you how many conversations I had with people to finally get to the point of talking somebody into saying, yeah, that's a good idea, and let's, let's do that. It took years to do this. And, and um, but now we're there, we're there now with a commitment that at this level, uh, they're putting money behind this 
uh, shared future monument or heritage marker going from school to school, department to department, and that, calling attention to it, and that. I, so I'm, I'm hopeful about that. Um, and I think the director of tribal relations is going to be going to these communities and listening. And he's gonna, he knows the university, Aaron Birdbearer, knows the university well enough to say, I think that I need to talk to the dean of CALS, or I think I need to talk to somebody in microbiology. I need to talk, and he'll, he'll have that sensibility because he understands the university. So he's going to be in a position of real translation. And that's a high level thing. Uh, that's going to be what he does, I think, a lot of the time. So I I'm think hopeful. that people were still very interested in what else needs to be done by ordinary people in the university and elsewhere. And I'm thinking of this because it is often very easy to say we're all the same. But I'm thinking of a case that uh, was involving Menominee, as a matter of fact, and recruitment to the university. And the issue there had been that the assumption from the university that all you needed to do was to think about that individual, find the qualified individual, when in fact, that ran, ran counter to sometimes the group <laughs> and the family kind of involvement. So this is a, a question of what kinds of things about nations, about the kinds of developments that need to be paid attention to so that we don't make mistakes at a time that you, Larry, are saying, this is a, this is a very positive period right. that we're in. Right. So I think this is a question, what do we need to do, though, to avoid some of the problems that could be there if we make assumptions about it's all the same mm. and where, what kinds of developments might, there, might be useful? Mm. Well, I think that the people who are doing that liaison work uh, have to have confidence in themselves and they have to know and be sensitive to cultural and historical regional differences that are in place. So there's the, the tribes in the state, if we're only concerned with the tribes of the state, and since we're talking about the Wisconsin idea, I think it's appropriate that we do, is for that person and those people to know that these tribes have different histories, they have different ecologies, they have different economies and such, and to have, to have a kind of a tribal view of Wisconsin rather than an Indian view of Wisconsin, I think would help. So that's, there's a lot of education that needs to be done there. And I suppose your suggestions apply not just to those who are in the positions, the formal positions, but this is a group of people who are very interested in what role they should be playing as well. And so that's a part of the question. How do you mm -hmm. have the kind of outreach to the entire community so that we make the kind of advances yeah. that you're talking about? And this is really to both of you mm -hmm. for any reflections. Yeah, that's, that's hard because you have to ask yourself, well, what are you, willi what are you willing to do? Uh, if you, uh, let's say a particular issue, there's usual, usually there are some um, legislative actions that are taken, and there are, some of them are okay, some of them are not, and I just came from a, a meeting, uh, Tammy will be interested in this, um, at the Reeb uh, Universalist ch Church on um, Washington Street, and uh, we have the whole thought, this has to do with the prison issue, because there are far too many people in prison and there's higher people of color in the prison percentages and the percentage of Indians related to the, their population is astronomical, it's terrible. At any rate, um, the, somebody has to have the watchdog on, this leg, on, on the legislature, what are they doing? And, and if they're doing bad law, which you usually are when it comes to the prisons, then, then this has to be called out. You have to get, find out who's on the committee and uh, find out how they get elected. Yeah, I would say that try to take part in the election process and change them if they're opposed to doing good things instead of bad things. That, that's one thing. It takes commitment, so it depends on how much you want to do. Right. There, there are causes, uh, uh, you could, you could Contribute money to the Native American Rights Fund. That's the NAACP of the Indian world, and um, they've been they've been in operation for a long time. Uh, they've done tremendous work. They helped us, the Menominees, 
uh, supplied two lawyers free time for free for us, and we didn't have any money, um, for two years and worked on, uh, work, worked with us to develop the Menominee Restoration Act. Uh, we had Professor Charles Wilkinson, who since then has become very uh, knowledgeable in Indian law, and he's an esteemed retired professor of law from the University of Colorado. And, and I had developed personal relationships with a lot of people, and I teased him once, and I said, well, he was new to NARF at that point, and I said, well, we taught you everything you, you need to know, because, well, because. So, at any rate, um, so there's money, there's social action, but I would say, uh, where's your the book I just gave you about the, the uh, powwows? There's a statewide um, tribal tourism body, I forgot what the name of it is, but um, they might have it on there. Official Guide to Native American Communities in Wisconsin. And, they, and it tells you, there's, a, there's maps in here, it gives you uh, information about the powwows. The powwows, people think, oh, it is, they, they're on and they dance, you know. No, there, there's a lot of background to the dances, to the songs, to the attire that, and the regalia that the people have. And uh, let's see, where to get this? Uh, I just want to add, while she's looking at that, this, the, this is an investment, I think, in time. I think about it in terms of my own, I've been in relationship with the tribes in Wisconsin for over 30 years. And I, and I feel like, I'm, and there are plenty of people who don't know me, right, and, and they have no idea who I am. I feel like it's a, it's, a, it's a big investment of time, and it becomes a matter of what are you willing to do? Are you willing to go visit a, a reservation community? Are you willing to go there and just hang out? and see who will talk to you and things like that. It's that Maybe you could say a little bit more about that and how you got involved with the fishing rights issues because that's been, that was one of the things that you said. Yeah, and it's, for me it started as, a, as someone who was um, interested in the activist part of it and I was interested in the social justice aspect of it and then I moved from being someone who was there as a witness watching this uh, conflict take place on the boat landings where Indian people were attempting to fish and non-Indian people were raising hell with them, calling them names, throwing things at them, etc. This is 30 years ago. Some of the gray hairs in the room might remember that. But I went there originally as an activist and then saw that this, no one was really writing about this other than local journalists. And I saw it as a kind of, in anthropological terms, as a kind of revitalization movement, as a social movement, and worthy of being studied and paid attention to. But it's, a, but it's an investment of time. And I, I think that with some of these things, it's an attraction. It's like, do you really care about this, right? And if you really care about this, well, you'll go and, and with no big expectation, go visit the Menominee Reservation, eat in a, a restaurant or something, see if their museum is open, talk to whoever you wind up talking to. It's that kind of stuff that eventually if, if successful or if, if it compels you further, will bring you further into these relationships. Who puts that out? Ada? Well, I, I, I can't find it in here, but it says, if you want to order, th if you want to order this, here's an 800 number. And so if, if those of you that are, would like this, here's the 800 number. It's 1-800-236-4000. I guess it must be a subscription. It doesn't have the, but there is, I know there is an entity that is devoted to tourism. And it should have it on there, but it doesn't. <laughs> Gotta pay attention to details. So I would say, you have to ask yourself, what do you know about the history? Now the fact that I could talk about the, the, the great march, the long march to this gentleman, and he's, he's Chinese, I'm an American, and we had this conversation, and he marched with Mao. You know, I thought that was, and, and when, I, uh, when he said that, I said, oh, you did? Wow, That's, uh, that is a, a very important um, action, you know? And so then he, he responded well, too. So if you know something, and you can read about the history and the culture. Like uh, there's the first, there's the picture there of the first uh, Indian school teacher. She happened to be Stockbridge Munsee, which is a little, it's a little piece of original Menominee land that the Menominees gave up for the Stockbridge Munsees. So and they have a beautiful uh, little uh, museum. Most of the tribes have some kind of cultural 
um, aspect to them or, or buildings. They don't have exorb, you know, exorbitant buildings, but they do have uh, uh, schools and they have, uh, well, you were just telling me about the eight hour tour at Oneida. Yeah. Right. I mean, the, tour, the, the tribes have tourism departments, right? And so all that stuff is available to people to do. Mm -hmm. I was wondering how I could stay better informed about current um, issues related to the Indian tribes. And In Wisconsin or the United States generally? Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Wisconsin, more specifically. Well, there's no, well, let's see. Some tribes have newspapers, right? And they are featuring mostly their their news. Um, well, news from Indian Country. Where is that? Just it, it, news from Indian Country has ceased publication after forty years. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Part of sovereignty is the fact that the category Wisconsin Indians is a white person's category. The tribes don't have that category as an entity, so there's no centralized place. So when they just says that we have multiple, you know, tribes all have websites. Yeah. But, but if, when the tribes are dealing with, with the Wisconsin legislature having something to do with a law or a program or whatever that would apply to all of them, I mean, how, how would I become knowledgeable? There, well, uh, this, this is getting into the weeds a little bit. There's a, there's a, uh, a, a state tribal legislative committee yeah. that you could Google that has an agenda on stuff. If you really want to get into the weeds on this kind of stuff, that's where you would go. Okay. But if you were interested in, in general, there's a thing called the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, which produces a quarterly publication and there's a website. But all the tribes in the state have websites, so that if you want to know what's going on in Oneida right now, there's that, and you could look at events for that. Right? There is also the annual report uh, to the legislature. What is it called? Right. The state of the, the state of the tribes address will be given, and that will be will be on TV. It will be streamed. It will be available to watch. That's probably coming up in February or March. Mm -hmm. Oh, one more, <laughs> one more question. Oh, oh, it's not current, but I was just going to say that. As part of teaching, I had for a while been compiling a whole lot of internet links. Um, you know, I, I mean, I do think that there's so, ma there's so many issues, it's hard to stay on top of all of them. But if you pick some stream of stuff you want to with some, and you're willing to use the internet, like Indian Country Today is still on the internet, it just stopped right. publishing as a newspaper. But um, there are... You can nationally go to Indian Country today and see whatever the news right. is. There's there. news from Indian Country that stopped publishing. Um, Out of Hayward. And there, you know, the the tribes have things, and then there's social movement groups that have things like um, Idle No More is an organization that's been doing a lot of stuff, and there's there's different political organizations that have campaigns that are going on. All right, we're going to have to wrap up for the evening, but let me thank you for the time you've spent with us. And this is a group that's been very interested in questions about how, what is their role, what is the role of all of us in keeping the Wisconsin idea alive. It isn't just something that happened some time ago, nor is it a vision that is just supposed to be handled by given people. So this, these kinds of questions that people are asking about how to be informed, mm -hmm. how to find out more, how, and going back to the question that we've been raising, how do we live with one another? And those kinds of things then are to be at the base of what we're all interested in. So I think what you've helped do tonight is to stimulate the interest that if we really are going to talk about democracy, about the living together, we've got to have a lot of understanding of the different kinds of communities, of the history that is, has been important, of the possibilities that sometimes things are really scattered. And looking through, for example, some of the educational materials for pre-college, it's just all over the place when it comes to native issues. And uh, that I think at times it's not quite clear where this all might lead. So I, I just want to, again, thank you for the time for stimulating the interest 
And to say then we're going to end for the evening, but there undoubtedly will be people who will want to talk with you some more. So please join me in thanking everybody. <laughs>